Welcome. I am Amy Liu. I am Vice President of the Brookings Institution and Director of the Metropolitan Policy Program here. And I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today's event is the first in a three-part series that we at Brookings Metro are hosting to raise the profile of local leaders in rebuilding local economies in better, more equitable ways. This first forum will examine the broad vision and the framework for achieving an equitable recovery. And I am delighted that we will be featuring two leaders who get this vision uh, fundamentally. And that is Mayor Lori Lightfoot of Chicago and Helene Gale, president of the Chicago Community Trust. For our second event, we will be joined by Robert Smith, who is the founder and CEO of Via Visa Equity Partners to discuss the importance of black businesses and community wealth creation. So do come back to join us on October 21st for that. And our third event will examine new initiatives in talent and skills development in this pandemic recession and beyond. So why are we elevating local action? Well, because we are living in a time when the nation needs leadership more than ever. And it is a blessing that there is a great deal of leadership in our cities and metropolitan areas where progress matters more than partisanship and collaboration transcends division. While the presidential debate tonight will explore the critical issues of public health, the economy, racial reckoning, and other new developments, it is local leaders who are doing the doing, not just talking. I see public, private, nonprofit sector leaders in communities who are engaged in the tireless and often behind the scenes work to meet the challenges posed by this pandemic. They are determining how best to ensure CARES Act funding reaches vulnerable families, schools, small businesses. These leaders are moving beyond the emergency response to lay the groundwork for a longer term recovery where every neighborhood and every worker is part of a dynamic wealth creating economy. And local leaders, CEOs, community groups are having genuine conversations about anti-racism, including what to do about it individually and collectively. It is these hundreds of local efforts that add up to the American promise and will drive the American future. And that is why our team at Brookings Metro released the COVID-19 Recovery Watch earlier this summer, which you can find on our website. Uh, we wanted to give local leaders the actionable ideas, the data tools, the inspiration to advance a higher quality economy with racial inclusion. Now, to be clear, this is not boilerplate economic rebuilding. The murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, and too many others have raised sharp awareness that we can no longer normalize injustice, whether it's in policing or in all the other rules that have locked many black workers and businesses out of wealth and opportunities. So going forward, our collective efforts must center black and brown talent and businesses in quality job creation, in community rebuilding, and in a more resilient society. It will require changing our metrics, it will require changing our practices, it will require changing the power dynamics at our civic tables. And that's because the moment demands nothing less. I wanna thank the Kresge Foundation, the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for making the Metro Recovery Watch and this event series possible. I also wanna thank Kresge for their vision and leadership in the Shared Prosperity Partnership, which is a collaboration with Brookings Urban Institute and Living Cities to support inclusive growth strategies in cities like Chicago. And speaking of Chicago, I am thrilled that today's program is focused on the leadership and efforts underway in Chicago, which is a hyper-diverse, immigrant-rich global city. Mayor Lori Lightfoot convened an inclusive recovery task force earlier this year. And when that group released its recommendations, the task, for call, task force called this crisis, quote, a once in a generation opportunity to make the city work even better by creating a new economic model based on inclusive growth that takes a holistic approach to development across both downtown and our neighborhoods. That is what today's session is all about. And I know I'm looking forward to hearing more from the mayor shortly about her vision and initiatives. 
Now to lead that conversation is someone I greatly admire. Helene Gale is the president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, which is one of the nation's largest community foundations and a close collaborator with the city. Under her three-year leadership, the trust has adopted a new strategic focus on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap in the Chicago region. Now, prior to the trust, Helene had an impressive career in global health, including a 10-year stint at the CDC. So it is not a surprise that when the NIH and the CDC with the National Academies decided to convene a special committee to assist policymakers in planning for equitable allocation of vaccines against COVID-19, they asked Helene to serve as its co-chair. Helene is also a trustee of the Brookings Institution and I'm grateful for her leadership with us on that. Now, before we hear from Mayor Lightfoot and Helene, my colleague, Joe Prilla, will br briefly walk through our framework for equitable recovery. Joe is an expert on inclusive economic growth and business dynamism, and he is the brains and energy behind the Metro Recovery Watch. So again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Joe, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Amy, uh, for the very generous introduction. And I, I should amend that a bit by saying that this is very much a team effort in uh, that I had the work of, uh, I'll be presenting the work of many colleagues and, and scholars at Brookings, as well as some of our practitioner friends. But I thought Amy set the context perfectly. And really two months ago, we launched this new suite of products, all focused on economic recovery. Uh, and we wanted to set a vision that braided together this need to rebuild better, meaning rebuild in ways that generate higher quality jobs and wealth creation opportunities, but also rebuild better in a way that advances racial inclusion in our cities. And the context for creating more and better jobs is clear. Uh, this spring in the span of weeks, a decade's worth of job growth was wiped out by the measures, the necessary measures taken to safeguard the country against COVID. And the context for intentionality around racial equity is also clear. Black and Hispanic or Latino households have been much more likely to report being affected by job loss during the crisis. And black workers in particular are disproportionately working in frontline occupations, such as grocery stores and childcare centers and healthcare facilities, putting themselves at risk to maintain critical services. And so we wanted to outline three principles for recovery planning. And the first derives from our concern that this crisis and eventual recovery period is going to exacerbate these challenges rather than ameliorate them. And therefore we argue that the first principle of recovery planning efforts should be the adoption of a shared vision. Uh, in our case, we think it's a higher quality, more racially equitable economy. And that vision should be embedded in quantifiable goals and metrics. And those goals and metrics should inform and guide and assess the success of these recovery strategies. We need to know where we're going and then measure whether we get there. With a vision in place, the second principle focuses on building out the complex capabilities necessary to launch and implement recovery strategies. Now we think capacity is developed through two things, uh, resources and collaboration. And collaboration requires trust across a diverse range of stakeholders. And the good news on that last factor, trust, is that 70% of Americans trust their local leaders, which is about double the share of Americans that trust Congress. But maintaining that trust is going to require continuous engagement of a diverse, and I want to be explicit here, a racially diverse set of actors in decision making as cities contemplate their recovery strategies. And it's through these broader diverse coalitions that we think recovery strategies will have the credibility and the buy-in to obtain uh, and attract the longer run multi-sector commitments that are going to up the odds of success. That if you can build these coalitions, more people can attach themselves to them, more funders can attach themselves to them, and it ups the odds of success. And then with these broader coalitions set against a vision for recovery, 
uh, we need to invest uh, broadly in the drivers of inclusive growth, which we bucket in these three areas. And I'll conclude my remarks uh, by previewing a set of nine concrete ideas generated uh, by a combination of my colleagues at Brookings Metro and a group of leading practitioners within our network uh, that really populate this framework. And the framework begins with incentivizing quality business growth uh, to create quality jobs. And the, the pressure is greatest among our smallest small businesses, those that anchor neighborhoods, often uh, communities of color, often micro businesses um, or biz small businesses owned by people of color. And for this, we put forward an idea led by the New Economy Initiative's Pam Lewis, which is profiling uh, the Detroit Means Business Coalition, which is a network of city and philanthropic and corporate leaders, which is trying to provide capital and equipment and technical assistance to Detroit's micro businesses uh, who provide critical amenities to neighborhoods and provide accessible jobs to residents. At another level, uh, Del Gines and Rodney Sampson, uh, Rodney is a non-resident senior fellow with us, recommend emulating and scaling efforts like Atlanta-based OHUB, which is working uh, in that city as well as Kansas City uh, to create racially equitable tech ecosystems, entrepreneurial ecosystems that center black and brown entrepreneurs. And the thesis is that by doing so, you can build multi-generational wealth in these communities and in the process create good jobs in high growth sectors that will likely uh, power the recovery. Our second driver recognizes that recovery strategies should be sourcing, and developing and connecting a racially diverse talent base. And my colleague Martha Ross and three Birmingham based leaders recommend uh, launching what they call local service corps. These are modeled on a novel effort in the city of Birmingham that deploys recently unemployed residents to meet short term community needs and eventually bolster longer term community health infrastructure. So the idea is that we have a lot of workers on the sidelines and no shortage of civically important work to do. And this effort has tried to meet that demand uh, by connecting displaced workers. We think this can be a model for uh, broader uh, efforts, both federally and locally. At a broader level, we know, and as my colleague Annalise Gozier recommends, that we, we need just a fundamentally more systemic rethink of career navigation and placement services, and particularly focusing those efforts on pathways that lead to better jobs, which is exemplified in a new effort out of Virginia called Virginia Ready, which seeks to do just this uh, in terms of uh, working, with displaced work, working with displaced workers. Finally, recovery strategies should support vibrant and connected and inclusive communities. And along those lines, Tracy Lowe and Jennifer Vey and Elwood Hopkins argue that local leaders could work with their state partners to launch what they call state funded, but hyper locally controlled community real estate investment trusts that through investments in neighborhoods can increase wealth and economic mobility for residents by allowing them to buy into and guide these trusts such that when their neighborhoods appreciate, they can build wealth alongside that appreciation and that this would be targeted uh, at those neighborhoods and those uh, residents that COVID-19 has hit particularly hard. And in an era where uh, broadband we know is critical infrastructure, both to work and learn, Adito Mayer and Lara Fishbane suggest that cities can emulate what Seattle has done in creating a digital equity office that promotes universal broadband access and digital skills literacy uh, for disconnected communities. Now, what binds each of these ideas together is they all link near-term resilience to longer-term economic transformation, racial equity, and economic inclusion. 
And in doing so, they are the types of solutions that require the investment and implementation abilities of broad, diverse, multi-sector coalitions. And this has been a preview, but you can find fleshed out proposals for all these ideas and much more uh, at our Metro Recovery Watch website. And now I'm thrilled to turn to the main event uh, for our program, which is a moderated conversation between Helene Gale and uh, the 56th mayor of the great city of Chicago, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot. And before I turn it to Helene, I just wanna remind folks listening online that if they want to participate, they can submit questions by email to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter using the hashtag Metro Recovery, one word. And with that, I have the distinct pleasure of turning it over to Helene Gale. Hi, uh, thanks, thanks so much, Joe, and, and thanks, Amy, for such a lovely introduction. Um, and I'm glad to see that our mayor is here. Hi. <laughs> uh, wish I could be there in person with you, but uh, anyway, we're so thrilled to have you with us. Um, and I guess you had a chance to hear a little bit of the, the uh, last presentation. But as I always say to people when I introduce our mayor, this is one of the hardest working people in all of America, maybe in all of the planet. <laughs> uh, you know, she knew she was coming into a tough job when she took it on. I don't think anyone could have predicted the number of challenges, uh, but she has uh, faced them with uh, grace and, and intelligence and commitment. So thanks so much for, you, for, for being here and being part of this. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I, I'll just get started. And maybe just to, to start off, you know, you, when you came in, you really came in with this um, incredible vision of equity for our city and making this a city that um, works for all. And um, then COVID happened, which highlighted, you know, some of the longstanding inequities. Um, just to give people a sense of, you know, what you came in with, what your thoughts were in terms of what you wanted to accomplish and how has that shifted um, as a result of this or, or um, how has it kind of amplified some of the things that you came in with? Well, um, thanks first of all to Brookings um, who's been a great thought partner for me and my team. Um, and Helene, I can't say uh, enough to thank you and the trust uh, for your incredible leadership um, during this difficult time. You know, I came into office, um, and anybody that knows the city of Chicago, the, the, the last 10 years or so of focus um, has really been on building our downtown, strengthening um, those surrounding neighborhoods, the South Loop, West Loop, and River North. So that's kind of the core of our downtown area. And we've done quite well. And so what that tells us is when we are intentional about how we focus, where we prioritize, and then how we invest, we can do remarkable things in partnership, of course, with local businesses, um, stakeholders, and so forth. But I came to office feeling like our vision of the city was essentially just that, and not the other um, 70 plus neighborhoods that made up the entirety of the city of Chicago. And when you talk about that in Chicago, what that means because of our high rate of segregation, it means that majority black, majority Latinx, majority immigrant neighborhoods were just left behind. That there was very little in the way of investment. Now there were some things happening. Um, certainly there's a lot of incredible uh, people in these neighborhoods and I, I won't list them because I'll forget someone and then I'll hear about it later. But what they lacked in my view was a partner and a mayor who saw the city for um, the beautiful mosaic that it was and was willing to invest resources um, and commitment and really bring other partners from philanthropy but also from the business sector into those neighborhoods to help them have the same level of um, vibrancy that we we're seeing in our downtown area. So you asked me um, how my vision of equity and inclusion has changed as a result of the pandemic, and you really alluded to it. I think the areas where we were strong shone through and really carried the day. But the areas where we were weakest, where we were vulnerable, where we hadn't made the kind of investments, 
those really flashed like neon signs. So not just in neighborhoods where we had to make the investments, but in people. When we think about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black and brown Chicagoans dying at an exponentially higher rate, higher instances of sickness, but also being those quote unquote essential workers that didn't have the luxury of teleworking, but had to take, uh, get in, get up, get up, get dressed every day and go to their jobs in the face of this pandemic that's, that was so unpredictable and continually scary. What we know is that we've got to do a better job of investing in our people, particularly when it comes to healthcare and the things that really make up a life expectancy gap and focus on those like a laser beam and we're doing that, but we have to speed up the timeline for how we invest and where we invest um, and with whom we partner to make sure that we're rising to the occasion um, that's really challenged us in our response to COVID-19. So um, you raised a lot of issues that I wanted to kind of delve into. And you know, because this is really focused on what uh, can happen at the local level, the innovation and particularly recovery, um, I wanted to ask about, about the recovery plan and you know, maybe frame it in, in three ways, the, the why, uh, the how, and then the what. Because I think, you know, um, obviously we all know we're in a public health and economic crisis and there has to be some thought uh, uh, for recovery, but everybody didn't do the kind of comprehensive plan you did. So, you know, why? You also did it in a specific way uh, bringing together different groups of people. And so, you know, uh, the how of it uh, was very important too. And you maybe talk about that. And then, you know, what were the main contours of what that task force came out with um, as an idea of some of the areas that we're going to focus on as a city? Well, why is, is, is obvious. We knew that, we were, that the impacts were going to be great. Uh, we knew that we needed to assess what those impacts were and then be ready uh, when our economy started to open, but really to kind of think, be thoughtful about how we could spur um, that recovery. So we started thinking about this really um, back in April. I pulled together um, our team on a Saturday and I think they thought I was um, a little crazy talking about recovery that early on when we were still seeing a fairly significant uptick in cases but I believe that you also have to look forward as you are in the moment and not just focus on battling the fire today, but looking down the road. So that's really what started the discussion. Um, because our economy, we knew was gonna be severely impacted. We didn't know in April how badly, uh, but we knew that it was gonna be impacted. We had a sense of what the sectors were, but I also wanted to think broadly, not just about the economic impact, but about how, um, COVID-19 had really impacted the social fabric of our city and what we needed to do to heal and recover, because that's, to me, an intrinsic part of economic recovery. If your people are hurting, if they are traumatized, um, if they don't feel hope and have a belief in tomorrow, then the economic recovery is never going to be as fulsome um, as you would like it to be. So we brought together a broad array of folks looking at 10 industry sectors, um, everything from uh, the typical businesses, manufacturing, hospitality, but also looking at um, our uh, mental health, healthcare, um, uh, and thinking about, as I said, holistically about the impacts of COVID-19. And we, the recommendations that came out, we were the first big city in the country to come up with a list of recommendations uh, for recovery. And we've now broken down the various um, recommendations into 17 different work streams that are now underway uh, with teams staffing each of those work streams, very specific scopes and milestones really through uh, next year. So we know that this is going to be not just a six month or nine month process, but it's going to take us through probably realistically the end of 2021. Some of the milestones that we've hit already are um, we secured $11 million for a 211 online work. We know that uh, we need to think um, more broadly about how we can get people connected up to services in a city 
and 311 has kind of been, become the catch-all, but it's not as effectively working um, as it could be. Uh, we're in the process of negotiating four more last mile warehouses with Amazon, um, and we'll be completing one of those next week. One of the big things that, um, in terms of thinking about economic development that came out of the task force, and I have to credit Melly Hobson of, of Ariel, um, who obviously knows a lot about Hollywood uh, through uh, her husband and said, look, right now, all production is shut down, but it's gonna start again and the city of Chicago should be well positioned. So with her help and the help of a number of um, other stakeholders here, we put together a series of pitch packages and went to every major studio um, in um, New York and in and LA and pitched them on why Chicago was a great place for them to come when they started uh, filming. We've got great facilities here in Cinespace and other facilities. Um, and I can tell you that Paper Girls, uh, which is a new movie that's coming online, is going to be um, starting filming uh, in January of 2021 through December of 2021. That, that alone will create um, 200 plus local jobs. And then other TV um, shows are coming back to Chicago uh, to begin filming. Um, we done, uh, Coming out of that, we um, knew we also needed to develop a citywide plan for planning. The city of Chicago has not had a land use plan since 1966. That's 1966. I was four years old at the time. Um, and so how development happens really was left to the vagaries of developers, local aldermen. We knew we needed a more robust and comprehensive plan, again, to make sure that we had an eye towards equity and really building up the infrastructure in lots of neighborhoods and directing and spreading development much more evenly across our district. So that citywide planning process has been presented to the city's plan commission uh, with a very positive reception and we look forward uh, to its passage. And obviously we partnered with the Chicago Community Trust uh, on a number of different funds, uh, the Together Now Fund and the Together We Rise Fund is one that we are um, scheduled to launch um, in early October. And again, what we want is specific commitments from businesses on a multi-year basis of what they will do either with um, direct uh, financial support or in-kind um, uh, benefits uh, to help in particular our small businesses um, help them recover uh, from the impacts of COVID-19. That's a, I could go on, but you have a sense of um, what we have focused on regarding recovery, but all of it is going to be driven by uh, our continued fight against the virus and making sure that we're very data driven um, in what we do. Yeah, and I think you, you raised several times the role of business uh, as well as philanthropy and other partners. And I would say, you know, it's one of the things that you, you have also really committed to is this working together with a broad range of stakeholders uh, so that there is greater ownership. And I think, you know, that that came through um, with the recovery task force. So hopefully that bodes well in terms of having a, a plan that people actually feel invested in. Um, one of the other things that comes across as you talk about it is that this is a pretty bold and ambitious plan uh, at a time when Chicago, um, not unlike other cities, are facing you know, real economic um, shortfalls. And you, you unfortunately inherited one, um, a hole that has you know, continued to grow. So what, you know, how, what do you think the role of um, outside dollars, particularly federal dollars, uh, will be in terms of thinking about the recovery and then also, you know, given the fact that uh, this is a big plan, we, you know, dollars um, are a part of it. How will you make trade-offs um, as you face some of these really tough, um, you know, financial challenges, uh, but still, you know, kind of keep us moving forward? Well, that's a that's a great question, and it also get, typically gets framed in mayor. Really sounds great, but. Um, how are you going to pay for it? Right. Um, so that's kind of the, and you're, you ask it in a much more polite way, but we get to the same place. You know, and I, and I, I view it this way. We, we cannot abandon our values because we are facing difficult times. You know, I've been through um, several economic cycles um, as an adult, 
And I think where we have fallen short, uh, both as a country, uh, but also as um, uh, individual businesses, is recognizing the importance of not abandoning our values, making sure that the things that we said were important are still a priority for us. They may be at a reduced scale, but not abandoning them. So give, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we know that there is an affordable housing crisis in Chicago. That's not gonna go away. If anything, it's gonna get worse. So if we retreat from our commitment in affordable housing, we're gonna put ourselves in an even deep, deeper hole as we recover, and we may not recover. You know this, um, Helene, one of my big priorities as mayor is to actually grow our population. Uh, we've seen year after year for the last five to six years that Chicago's population has shrunk. And I fear that after the next census is complete, whenever that's complete, um, that we're not gonna be the third largest city in the country that will be four or five. And we've got to turn that around. Chicago is not only uh, the economic engine for the state of Illinois, it's the economic engine for the upper Midwest. And we've got to make sure that we are building a future where people believe that they, their destiny is here in the city of Chicago. If we retreat from housing, mental health, uh, workforce development, all the things that we know are critically important for people to believe that they've got a stake, that we've got a stake in their future, that they can build a life here in our city, all we're doing is opening the exit door even wider. Now, again, some of those investments may not be as robust as we would have liked given our economics um, situation, but my view is we can't afford not to invest. And I think that government really does have an important role to play as a stimulus. You ask about money from the federal government. Man, I wish I could look into a crystal ball and tell you what that's gonna look like. We keep pushing, uh, we keep uh, cajoling, uh, but really it's gonna come down to whether this president before the election wants to do right by cities and towns all across the country, not just blue cities, not just democratic controlled cities, but every city across the country has been dramatically impacted regardless of who the leadership is. And we all are struggling and we all need help from the federal government. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I don't think we need to make the case more. It's just a question at this point of political will. And my hope is that before uh, the Congress recesses for the election, that they're gonna announce that we actually have made some progress. It may, may not be as ambitious as the package was passed uh, by the House earlier this summer, but cities and towns are, are dying for resources and have cut their personnel to the bone, have cut services to the bone and without some additional help. And it really could only come from the federal government. Um, we have another set of extraordinarily painful choices that we're gonna have to make. So I'm hoping that the cries of all of us are actually gonna resonate with the president and the Republican leadership. But if they don't, um, then we're not gonna get it done uh, before the election. You know, um, another, situation crisis um, uh, that has kind of un unfolded in the midst of this has been um, unfortunately you know uh, linked to but not um, necessarily totally aligned with the death of George Floyd, um, the protests and then leading to civil unrest. Um, Chicago has had to deal with that like other uh, major cities. And you know, at, at a time when we need the trust of everybody moving forward in the same direction, you know, it's been one of the challenges you've had to face recently, uh, um, and you know, in some ways, still facing it. How has that influenced um, how you are thinking about the recovery work, and what other work there is to be done, if you will, um, for the city? You know, it's a great, but as you well know, complicated question. Um, we certainly support uh, peaceful protest. I think everybody was horrified and shocked by the brutal murder of George Floyd. And it unearthed um, a, a sentiment um, that was really always there, but maybe just below the surface. What's been unfortunate is that kind of the righteous protest has been hijacked at times by what I would call vigilantes who embed themselves into these protests and use the moment of kind of collective outrage and grief 
um, to hijack the agenda for something, in my view, much more sinister. And then the, the third layer of this, so there's a peaceful protest, there's the people that are hijacking those protests, but a third layer, which is even more cynical, are the people who are the criminal uh, gangs um, and crews that have taken advantage of this moment uh, to loot um, and, and really cause harm to businesses of all size uh, across Chicago, but really across the country. And so we're dealing with all three of those elements at the same time and really never knowing when element two um, or element three is going to hit, which requires an extraordinary amount of diligence um, and readiness um, to be able to pivot from peaceful protests to vigilantism in these protests um, to um, criminal uh, crews and gangs coming to loot and damage um, our businesses. And, and the peaceful protests are one thing, but the other two elements have dramatically impacted our businesses. Now, it's a huge drain on city resources and has, and has caused our overtime budget of our police department to really balloon in ways that, that are contributing to um, our deficit. Uh, but we, we have to make these sacrifices in order to keep people in neighborhoods and businesses safe. But what it's also done, I think, is really undermine confidence among businesses. It's really hurt small businesses who can't just go to the insurance company and restock and start all over again. They don't have the same kind of uh, margin for error, if you will, that larger companies do. But even the larger companies can make choices about where they're gonna to continue to invest in a challenged economic environment. And if we don't make a very clear statement of protecting those businesses and going after uh, the wrongdoers, um, we're gonna lose um, a lot of confidence and it's gonna, it's gonna dramatically even worsen our economic crisis. So what we have tried to do is strike a very difficult balance in supporting peaceful protests but having no tolerance whatsoever for any criminal activity of any sort, no matter what the source is. Um, and constantly calibrating that balance um, is something that we work on literally every day um, to be supportive of our residents so they feel like we're, we're hearing them, um, whatever it is that they're saying. And they're all speaking in very different voices at different times. But that is one of the biggest challenges I think I have as mayor, and I know from talking to my colleagues across the country, it's a big challenge for them as well. And we've seen, um, unfortunately, in some cities, the pendulum swing um, in one direction or another. And we've tried to stay steady in the middle um, to be hearing voices from either side, but really, be in the heartland because I think that's where most residents are. Yeah, and I, you make a good point. I think this is one of those listening moments that is one of the most important things uh, sometimes um, somebody in your uh, office can do is to just show that you're open and, and listening and, and that, that people feel like they're heard. You know, another uh, component of what you kind of touched on is that, you know, I think you've also made um, quite a good balance between you know, the focus on the small businesses that don't necessarily have access while keeping in mind um, the, the, the businesses that drive a lot of economy. Um, and you mentioned the Together Now Fund, which really helped to provide funds to small businesses that had been damaged primarily in um, black and brown communities. And so, you know, I think it, it is a difficult tightrope, but um, we appreciate that you continue to try to figure out how to calibrate that. You know, it, it reminds me of another aspect of this. You know, we, you talked about kind of our gleaming downtown um, and we always talk, you know, there has been much made about the fact that we have one of the largest life expectancy gaps. And if you live in our gleaming downtown, you live to 90. If you live a few miles away on the south and west side, you live to 60. Um, we are faced with a public health challenge that has caused an economic crisis but public health has been really at the center of a lot of your uh, activities throughout this. And your public health department is well known for its focus on health equity. Could you say a bit more about how public health has really been so core to this 
and how um, the public health response has been one that has put equity so front and center, which has actually radiated throughout your um, uh, administration. Yeah, I mean, it really has been the, the public health um, department and guidance has been core to literally everything that they've done, uh, particularly in responding to the pandemic. They've been front and center. Um, and I say this all the time. Um, it is a blessing to have a public health department, not only led by a very talented leader, a great team, but really forward thinking um, around things like preparation. You recall back in the early parts of the uh, pandemic when it really hit um, Chicago and the Midwest in early March, um, a lot of places were scrambling for PPE, for ventilators, um, the basic supplies that you needed to be able to respond and keep people safe. We didn't have that scramble, um, in part because our public health department places a huge premium on keeping a stockpile all year round. And so what we were able to do was actually provide um, resources to private hospitals, um, local um, health providers, um, and private ambulances, businesses, um, think places that we normally don't provide material support to in terms of PPE. We were able to really get them through uh, the crisis until more resources came online. Our ventilator supply, we were shipping those out uh, to hospital ICU rooms that were in crisis. And so they really incredibly rose to the occasion, um, but they also were following um, the data. Um, and that data revealed these healthcare disparities. One of the things that um, we saw early on was that um, providers who were, get, who were doing testing and then sending that information off up into uh, the public health system were not tracking race and ethnicity. Uh, we were missing 50% of uh, that uh, information on any given series of tests uh, results that were coming in. And so we really bore down on that issue um, and focused, um, you know, we always try to educate people in compliance first, but had to call certain providers and labs and say, you cannot skip the demographic information. We must understand um, how this is impacting all Chicagoans. We got much better uh, with that as time went on. But as we started to see these numbers roll in, that's when we started to see the disparities. Now, again, I'm not gonna say that it was a terrible surprise, although I will tell you uh, when I saw the numbers on uh, black Chicagoans dying, at a rate seven times any other demographics, that was like getting a punch in the gut. I mean, it really took my breath away. But it all made sense because of the healthcare disparities. The lack of access to high quality, affordable healthcare has been well documented um, in Chicago and other cities across the country. Um, I just recently reread um, David Ansel's incredible book, The Death Gap. Um, David Ansel is um, a doctor at Rush Hospital here and spent most of his uh, career treating um, residents on the west side of Chicago, which is a problem, predominantly black neighborhood. And, and to see the really two tale of two different healthcare systems that led to radically different outcomes for patients, even at the youngest of age, and certainly as um, life wore on, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to say it's a great read because it's a difficult read, but I think it really tells the story of where we need to, where we need to do, how we need to invest, and the sense of urgency uh, that we need uh, in order to start to shrink these healthcare disparities. And COVID-19, again, just exacerbated those underlying disparities. So we still have much work to do, but I think our sense of urgency seeing these disparities made us um, become even more committed to grassroots partnerships with trusted people in the communities, very hyper-local uh, focus. Uh, we placed a huge premium on federally qualified healthcare centers that we're continuing to kind of uplift as essential partners in helping us fight uh, these disparities. We launched a contract taste, uh, tracing uh, initiative uh, where we're going to hire 600 people over time. And these are people drawn from neighborhoods 
uh, where there's low opportunities uh, for jobs. And the idea in the long term is to create a community-based healthcare core in Chicago that will help us again um, shrink these healthcare disparities because there'll be people from the neighborhood going to their neighbors and talking to them about what they can do to help themselves uh, lead healthier, more vibrant lives. Well, you, you um, just kind of jumped to what my next question was, which was about unemployment. And I, I was going to give the example that using this health force was one of the innovative ways, uh, this contract uh, tracing force is one of the innovative ways of looking at dealing with the uh, unemployment, particularly the unemployment that was caused as a result of COVID. So uh, maybe say a little bit more about some of the ways that you're thinking about that. You know, you really put this focus on small businesses, but you've also put a lot of focus on the unemployment that uh, uh, was caused as a result of COVID. Well, look, fundamentally, we have to think about how we build wealth in, in new communities, meaning communities that haven't traditionally been invested. And building wealth is shoring up the small business core for sure, because they hire from the communities, uh, but also giving individuals opportunities to advance themselves. So of the 600 people that we hope to employ through this at $20 an hour uh, with benefits, um, they are connected up to not only our public health department, but they'll be connected up to other earn and learn opportunities so that they can build out a skill set that goes beyond uh, contact tracing. So when we get to a point where we won't need this scale of contact tracing, they'll have a skill set that will readily be marketable, both as part of city employees, but also to private sector employment, hospitals, doctors, um, other community based healthcare centers, so that we have, you know, healthcare is one of the growing um, industries. It's part of our economic development plan for the larger city. And if we get people the skill sets that they need to be part of this growing part um, of our economy, um, that's only going to endure um, to their benefit and to the city's benefit. So we are very, very excited about the opportunity that this community-based healthcare core uh, really creates. And we're focused on uh, people who have little to no job history, our, our returning citizens, um, and other people who have not been able to get the kind of employment that they need to really build a life on. And we wanted to go beyond the mere minimum wage. That's why we set the amount at $20 per hour plus benefits um, so that we can then um, give them the ability to start creating wealth for themselves and their families. You know, another, another thing you touched on um, is this population loss. And, and this is a big focus. You know, a lot of people have said that in this whole era of COVID and uh, working anywhere you want, that cities are going to die. But you're really bullish on cities and the importance of it. And one of the ways that's been manifest has been how you've embraced this whole transit-oriented development mm -hmm. as part of your agenda um, and, and including the equity component of that. Say a little bit about how that has figured into your thinking as you're looking at planning and thinking about how we build cities that work for everybody. Well, I, that, that's a great point. We, I think transit-oriented development um, has an idea that's been around for a while, but it hasn't had really an equity lens. So a lot of the development that you've seen are studio apartments, maybe one or two bedrooms at the least. Well, those aren't large enough to accommodate families um, and they're not affordable enough uh, to keep um, you know, working class families and individuals in the city. So we actually have just announced um, a new initiative here in Chicago, where we are focused on equitable transit-oriented development. So the same concept, but doing it in a way that really broadens um, the lens of people who are gonna be able to take advantage of this opportunity. And so that we are not displacing indigenous residents in neighborhoods, but we're creating new opportunities for them to be able to live in um, developments that are funded by the city and private developers. So I think this is, this is really going to have, if we do it right and we're diligent, really going to have tremendous impact 
um, and, and, a, and a create a circumstance where we're creating diverse um, communities um, through transit-oriented development and not reinforcing uh, the segregation that's plagued our city for far too long or um, allowing for indigenous residents to be displaced as new development comes online. So it's all about intentionality in my, in my view. You've got to be conscious of what your policies are and not just let the market um, uh, run its course because we've seen uh, that market forces aren't always uh, working well when it comes to equity. So I like to think of it as a free market with um, some regulation. <laughs> And intentionality. I love that. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions because I see that I'm. Uh, we only have about ten more minutes. Uh, so, the questions from audience. Uh, one good question, which we always want to know, is what metrics and goals are you going to use? This says uh, to reduce ethnic wealth disparities, but I would add to that also what metrics and goals for knowing that you're successful in recovery. Well, I think a lot of things. One, we've had over 900,000 people apply for unemployment um, in the city of Chicago. So we want to see how that number drops dramatically. Um, we're also looking at um, what is forecast is a wave of evictions. How do we um, minimize the impact of that? Foreclosures, obviously, is a close second when you talk about uh, evictions, but also what are we doing to grow and support new businesses coming online? We are seeing and we feel very fortunate um, that the depth of our um, drop um, in, our, in our economy is not as deep as other cities across the country and our recovery is coming back online a little faster uh, than what we're seeing. We're nowhere out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, but just things like um, we're looking at um, hotel occupancy. In the height of COVID-19 shutdown, occupancy was really in the single digits in our hotels, and in some instances at zero for a lot of hotels. Um, two weekends ago, uh, we had we were close to 50% occupancy in hotels in downtown Chicago. Again, not where we need to be, but see, showing uh, signs of life. Um, Bank of America, as you might imagine, does extensive um, economic analysis um, of its customers, economic analysis of the economy in general. And one um, data point is credit card spending um, in Chicago is um, almost back at pre-COVID rates. Now that's spending on different things, people are staying home more, um, but the fact that people um, are not hoarding cash, um, but are, are feeling confident enough to be able to spend is obviously a very good sign. So those are some of the metrics uh, that we'll be measuring. Um, and really, again, we know where our economy has been hit the hardest and watching how they how it recover, those industry sectors, hospitality in um, particular, watching how they recover. But also we're not just watching, we're working with our industry partners to come up with um, plans short-term and long-term uh, to help them get over this hump and then be ready to take advantage um, of opportunities when the economy really reopens um, in 2021. There's another um, question that um, asked about um, the widening racial skills gap and you know how are we thinking about that and I you know obviously we're all concerned about the fact that children are staying out of school um, or not not staying out of school, but are not going back into the classroom, what implications that may have, and particularly what does that do long-term when we think about the skills gap in, in black and brown children. So thoughts about how, how you're thinking about um, this widening skill gap that could get even wider. Well, um, I, I, I share those concerns. I'm very much concerned about uh, the impact on our children particularly the youngest, um, starting their school life um, remotely. You know, I have such fond memories of um, kindergarten. There was no such thing as preschool um, when I was growing up, but I have such fond memories of kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And that's really where, um, if you get to children and, and help teach them the love of learning, it'll stay with them for their whole lives. 
starting out remotely where they literally can't touch their teacher, give them the hug, um, uh, uh, really get socialized with their classmates. I worry a lot about that. And data that we've seen nationwide is preschool, kindergarten, first grade numbers are down significantly um, in school districts uh, that have gone to all remote learning. That's a significant challenge that we're gonna have to address um, in very, very thoughtful ways. And Chicago Public Schools understands that data uh, and is working on very specific plans for outreach to bring those children uh, back into uh, the public school system. But it's a challenge that we're seeing um, school system face really nationwide. But I also wanna talk about the second part of your question, which is the skills gap. And it's a real issue. We have placed a tremendous amount of emphasis at, in public schools on college. And college is great, right? We've all been beneficiaries of going on to higher education. But college isn't for every student. So the college or bust mentality, and I'm exaggerating obviously, but we've got to give our young people options. And I also think one of the other things that we have to do a better job of <clears throat> is really exposing, uh, particularly kids of color, to people who look like them in unusual, in air quotes, jobs. Meaning, we've got to show that there are doctors, there are lawyers, there are architects, there are engineers, but also in the trades, that there are carpenters, uh, there are plumbers, um, that all the jobs that uh, are different than what, uh, that are something different than being a rap star or being an athlete. We've got to teach our kids that these different professions where you can really have a meaningful career, that there are black and brown people, there are women that are in these jobs. And, you know, as the saying goes, uh, you can't be what you can't see. We've got to really present these options to our young people at a much younger age to really start them thinking about, hey, that might be something that I'd love to do. You know, for example, our Art Institute um, is um, expanding and creating a whole um, section on art preservation. And I had the opportunity in one of our programmings to talk to some of the art preservationists. Um, and this is like a very skilled um, uh, work, very meticulous, um, but very rewarding. And if you're an art lover, which a lot of our kids are, and you, can, you have the attention to detail, I dare say that most of our kids and probably a lot of adults have no idea that these kinds of jobs even exist. And I just cite that as one example, but I think we've got to do a better job of exposing our young people to the kind of jobs that people actually are doing right here in Chicago. So we expand their horizon. Now, not everybody's gonna go and be um, somebody who preserves fine art um, in a uh, museum like the Art Institute, but knowing that that exists expands one's horizons. And so we've got to do a better job of making sure that we're preparing our young people, not just for the jobs of today, but the jobs of tomorrow. And the last thing I'll say about this, and hopefully you can tell I've given a lot of thought um, to uh, this issue, is we've got to get employers uh, to open up their minds about um, our students and the talent that they present. So there are a number of programs through our city colleges, but also some private workforce development programs. Year up is one I talk about all the time, where these are kids that maybe had a little bit of college, but for, for a variety of reasons, weren't able to finish, but they're skilled, they're well-trained, they're great workers. And so we are cha they're challenging employers to say, well, think about your job description. Are you reflexively saying college degree necessary when maybe it's not? Maybe the equivalent of life experience uh, and work experience uh, and somebody who has been well-trained to do that job actually is somebody who'd be a great employee for you. So there's a lot of things that I think we can do and we must do as we think about recovery, but also as we think about the next steps um, in widening uh, economic opportunity for lots of different people who have been left behind. Well, not only have you thought a lot about that, you have thought a lot about everything that I've asked you, um, which I, uh, I hope is um, 
clear to the audience that even in this difficult time, you know, you still have a real passion for your job. So maybe in the last minute we have remaining, um, in the midst of all this, just tell us uh, why you continue to have um, such passion, but even more than that, such optimism and such hope about this city. Well, I, I do have a passion uh, for the job. I mean, I'm not gonna, uh, I would be lying if I didn't say, this has been a very tough year. Um, when I think about, I'm 17 months into this job, it feels like uh, more like dog years, um, given the back to back to back crises uh, that we face. Um, but I love to learn, I love to challenge myself. Um, but I also think about those people that I've met along this journey who are, are really working hard in difficult circumstances and they still have hope. Let me give you a very concrete example. Monday, June 1st, um, I'll remember this day for the rest of my life. It was a Monday after a horrible weekend of protests, violence, and looting. I, I've never experienced anything like it. It's probably one of the um, times when I've felt the most despair um, in my time as mayor. And so that Monday morning, I got up very early and I started on the far south side of our city to go out and assess for myself the damage that I'd only been seeing uh, through uh, video and camera of uh, footage. And I met so many people that day who literally their lives work as small business people was just destroyed. I had many people cry on my shoulder um, and just really have to muster the strength uh, to lift themselves up from this wreckage um, that was all around them. But to a person, even the people who had no reason to hope at all, they all did. They all urged me on. We were two days away from the start of reopening our economy after a shutdown from COVID-19. And every single person I asked, are we ready as a city? Should we reopen? What I got back was, Absolutely, Mayor. We need to reopen. Our customers need to see us. Our employees need to come back to work. I mean, I was in stores, literally, there was nothing left on the walls. They had just been stripped bare. And yet even those small business people had hope. So I think about those people that represent, I think, really the heart of Chicago. When I feel down, when I feel despair, I, I remind myself of what those people went through and how much they need me to be at the top of my game to really muster the resources of the city government and to urge uh, the private sector, philanthropy, business, community-based organizations for us to keep moving forward together because that is the only way that we will truly recover. And that excites me, it gives me energy. Um, and makes me humble for sure, but really keeps me motivated um, to be the best mayor that I can possibly be for those people. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and you know, I could go on asking um, questions forever. It's fascinating, and and I always learn a lot. Um, and I just want to thank you for the incredible job you're doing, not only for Chicago, but for being an inspiration to the nation. These are tough times, um, and, and we need people who have the kind of courage and conviction that you do, uh, because that's what it's going to take for all of us um, to get past this and, and get on to that vision um, that you so brilliantly um, portrayed. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And um, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and thank you, Brookings, for uh, the start of this wonderful series. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.